Hello and welcome to the Fundamental Value Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Frank, co-founder and CEO of The Tie. Uh, today I'm joined by Hannah Rod, uh, CEO of Solidus Labs. Uh, before we even get started, quick disclaimer, nothing is financial advice. Um, Hen may have great ideas on tokens. He's not giving you advice. So read our disclaimers in the, uh, in the comment section below. And if you're listening to the podcast, you can see our disclaimer section. So Hen, it's great to have you on. Thanks, Josh. Really great to be here. And I have to say, before we even get started, that I think you're one of the only people in the industry that pronounces my name properly. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, uh, it helps being Jewish. So I think it's... Uh, Exactly, you know, exactly. I've had to, I've had a lot of challah, so you know I just put two and two together, and you know. <laughs> yeah, no, because you know my name is spelled Chen, uh, and I usually just tell people because I don't want to spend twenty five percent of my day explaining that it's actually Chen. I just tell people to call me Chen, but uh, really appreciate your uh, uh, Jewish. Well, I, I guarantee, I guarantee, we have listeners now trying to pronounce Chen and not be able to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're welcome to reach reach out to me if they want to practice. So, so yeah, let's get right into it. So. You have, I think, one of the most interesting backgrounds in crypto. Um, you were a news editor, you were a lecturer at Brandeis, and now you somehow found yourself co-founding a crypto company. So, like, can you tell us about the journey of Chen and, and how you got here, how you, how you ended up, you know, you know, in crypto and falling down the rabbit hole? First of all, I don't know if you can see, but I'm blushing. Uh, I think it's the first time someone told me that I have the, one of the most interesting backgrounds in crypto because you meet a lot of people with very, uh, uh, you know, intriguing backgrounds in this space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I spent uh, most of my career or adult life uh, doing uh, journalism. <clears throat> I started at the, uh, I mean, actually when I was even in high school, but then uh, in the Israeli army, I served as a foreign press spokesman, which led me to a few uh, editorial and uh, writing positions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, ultimately, I ended up uh, coming to the U.S. to get uh, uh, you know, to, for school at Brandeis University, which you mentioned. I kept on writing for Israeli publications from there. Uh, for anyone who's following Israeli publications in politics, so I used to write for Haaretz, which is a very lefty publication, but I also used to do television reporting for uh, Channel 20, which is like the Israeli Fox News. So I have, uh, <clears throat> I have lip service in both directions. Um, and... Uh, and as part of that, I also did some, uh, I mean, I did, uh, I was a lecturer for media and politics at Brandeis. You know, uh, you know I'll get into, I'll probably get into the story of how Solidus came about, uh, you know, a, a little uh, in a bit. But, uh, you know, I will say this, it may sound like journalism is a very different uh, ball game from, uh, you know, what we're doing as entrepreneurs, definitely in crypto. But at the end of the day, for me, journalism, the, the, the fundamental <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, mission of a journalist is to take complex stories, and, uh, sorry, take, to take complex issues and explain them and find compelling ways to tell them as stories. Uh, and in a, in a way, that's what I'm doing today as well as, uh, you know, as the chief operating officer at Solidus, uh, dealing with our communications, with our partnerships, etc. I don't need to tell you, Josh, that uh, everything is about building a narrative. Um, and in that sense, uh, it's more similar than you'd think. Um, uh, you know, in terms of how I got here, uh, you know, I, I did I did do some financial reporting, uh, and I had a couple of uh, I had a couple of uh, I had a very very good friend from uh, Brandeis University who ended up at Goldman, uh, and he uh, was the driving force behind behind the founding of Solidus. You know, it was 2016, 2017. I was interested in uh, Bitcoin and crypto assets like everyone else, and uh, uh, my two uh, co-founders at Goldman were uh, a, you know decided to jump uh, into the space and uh, we're looking for someone uh, with my skill set. And uh, here I am. And so what was your first experience with crypto? I know you mentioned that you, you know, were tracking and following it. Were you investing before you, you know, you kind of joined them or was, was, did you just kind of just like take a blind leap of faith and be like, all right, let's do this crypto thing. Well, I wouldn't say a blind leap of faith, but there was a leap of faith there. I mean, honestly, as like, like uh, anyone who changed, you know, does a major career transition or, just decides to uh, found their own company. Um, I did experiment with digital assets. I was never a big investor. Uh, I just uh, didn't have the money to invest. You know, uh, there's not a lot of money in journalism or in education. <laughs> but, uh, but I did experiment. Uh, you know, I remember uh, investing pretty early on, for example, in Neo, uh, which I found really, really interesting. I uh, was able to uh, quadruple the few hundred dollars that I invested. And of course, you know, I had a few other investment experiences. I did a lot of research on the space before I decided to jump in. Um, 
because me and my co-founders were talking about what are the places where we can bring value here. Uh, but I was never a big investor, um, even though I did al always found it extremely uh, interesting. And so, so, you know, why compliance and market integrity, right? You know, what, what specifically about that, uh, you know, either intrigued you or intrigued your co-founders and, and kind of was like, you know, hey, this is, the, this is the path to crypto. And I guess that segues into my next question, which is, you know, what is Solidus Labs, right? I, I guess I gave a little bit of a, a sneak peek there, but. No, absolutely. So, you know, it was uh, 2017, which I don't need to tell uh, you and probably I don't need to tell most of our listeners was a, was a wild year when it came to crypto and when it came to digital, crypto and digital. Wait, what, what happened? Sorry. <laughs> In 2017. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm obviously I'm referring to the ICO boom and just generally today, Nothing. enormous amounts of buzz uh, that, uh, you know, you did get me there for a second. I started getting <laughs> nervous. Did I get the year wrong? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we, and we were looking at it. We were fascinated, fascinated, like I mentioned, by, the, by this new asset class, by its potential to transform finance. Um, but, and we were really trying to kind of sift through the buzz and understand what could provide value in the long run. A fundamental value, if I, I'm sorry for keep constantly going back to it, but I will say that I, I usually use the word fundamental quite often. I just love it. Um, anyway, uh, you know, my, you know, we, we had a lot of experience uh, from, uh, you know, my, my friends, uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, my, my co-founders time at Goldman, uh, you know, w working on very complex systems and oftentimes having to adapt them to regulatory requirements, uh, you know, specifically post 2008. Uh, a, 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 you know, and just to be clear, uh, most of our, you know, at this point, most of our leadership actually came from uh, Goldman, a, and very, many of them from the equities trading uh, technology desk, right? Uh, so, looking at kind of what we're bringing with us, uh, and and also looking at, uh, you know, we, we realize compliance is a place where we could provide value and re can really create some solution. And then when we looked more deeply into it, we saw a very very interesting. Uh, scenario, right? Like we look, we, as I mentioned, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of people were uh, investing and, and kind of trying to understand the space. Um, and uh, when we looked into it, we saw that when it comes to market integrity and to compliance, uh, it's going to be a big challenge. At the time, 2017, we already saw that there were a lot of great companies. Today, we work with them as partners and, uh, and, uh, and the complementary services. Uh, they were focused on the origination of funds. So right when uh, you know, earlier on, the first thing that regulators tried to focus on was really where, where's the money coming from on chain, et cetera. And also who is it that's, that's transferring the money? So the anti-money laundering side of things and the uh, know your customer side of things. Uh, what we didn't see a lot of is people working to understand how can you uh, uh, ensure market integrity? How can you detect market manipulation in this space? And there were already then consistent reports about high levels of market manipulation. Uh, ever since then, they kept on coming out, uh, you know, consistently. Um, and I guess, uh, and, and we looked at it and we said, you know, market manipulation is something that has been largely addressed in traditional markets. Uh, there, there are, uh, you know, systems that are designed to detect these sort of things in equities markets. Uh, and yet, it's still a major problem here. You know, I, I mean, some of the, the reports I mentioned talk about 90, 95% uh, of the volume that is potentially manipulative. I think what really was the, the, the kind of final straw, what really made us decide that this is what we're going to focus about, was actually the ETF uh, uh, question. Uh, you know, the various companies, including Gemini and uh, others that followed, were already at the time applying with the SEC uh, for an ETF rule change application. For three years before you guys started, people were applying. I mean, it right. started in 2015, I think. True, yeah. true. And to us, it was very interesting that even though a few years passed since the early applications, uh, like right. you say, uh, the SEC was still rejecting it. And when you looked at the rejection document, it was fascinating to see that there are two major issues. One of them, of course, was custody. The other one was market manipulation. If you look at the rejection documents, they're usually around 90, 100 pages long. The words manipulation and surveillance usually appear there over 100 times each. Um, and, and, and the word, and specifically surveillance in the context of shared surveillance. Uh, to us, there was, again, just another proof. These are the... The ETF specifically, right, were supposed to be traded in fully regulated exchanges. Uh, so there wasn't a concern that they're going to be manipulated. But what the regulator kept on focusing on is the inherent challenge of digital assets. The fact that they're not native to a single exchange and therefore could potentially be manipulated in, in the many unregulated exchanges 
Uh, and what was also particularly interesting for us is that some of the companies that applied were already utilizing traditional surveillance systems that were designed for other asset classes and were nonetheless rejected. At that point, we looked at it and we said, these are fundamentally different assets for various reasons, which I can elaborate on, and they require fundamentally tailored or uh, specialized uh, solutions when it comes to risk monitoring. So, so an example of something like that would be like a NASDAQ smarts, right? What you're talking about in terms of like existing, you know, equity solutions or? Yeah, NASDAQ Smart is, uh, is, is one of the leading uh, legacy solutions uh, for equities, exactly. And, uh, and so where did, where did you kind of, you know, at least initially, and, and maybe it changed, I know NASDAQ Smart's built a, I think they built a solution for Gemini for crypto, right? So, um, you know, where did you kind of see the disconnect between, you know, serving equity markets and, and, or, or, or even commodity markets or FX markets and anything else with surveillance and, and where that kind of fell short in crypto? What were, what were kind of those you know, what, what did you see was, was kind of missing there? So first of all, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk any, to say anything bad about, uh, you know, other companies. Needless to say, Nasdaq Smarts and a lot of the other systems that were designed for securities or other asset classes are award-winning systems. Uh, they're great. We're not, we're not talking shit. We're just asking for what, 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 but, what, what does but, crypto require that, yes. that, that existing solutions but can handle? But at the end of the day, these are fundamentally different assets. So you know, we, we decided that this is what we're going to focus on. We started building first iterations of our solution, which just to be clear in terms of what our solution actually does, it helps our clients detect, investigate, manage, and report uh, a market manipulation instances, as well as other trade, trade and transactional abuse. They usually, uh, the reason they choose to work with us is usually as part of a licensing application, as well as just to protect their clients from these sort of behaviors which are illegal in traditional markets and are becoming increasingly illegal in these markets as well. We can talk about regulation later, but so we, you know, we came with our early version of the products uh, to talk to clients and clients who were using legacy systems to try and monitor for risk in digital assets, uh, you know, just told us that it's, 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 uh, it's very, very difficult. Some of them described to us very, very high levels of false positives. Some of them, uh, you know, uh, very, very complex operational, uh, a patchworks that you had to build around because of the need. And look, and, and, and it, it makes sense if you think about it, right? Uh, when, I, when I say that these are fundamentally different assets, it means a lot of different things. Uh, and, and when I say that our solutions are crypto native, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's the way that we address all of those issues. Uh, you know, first, first of all, market structure, right? Just a few examples, markets that operate 24 seven, where people can open accounts relatively easily versus ha they're, uh, having a lot of locks. Um, uh, you know, uh, and again, I, I already mentioned probably one of the most uh, challenging uh, structural difference, right? The fact that most of the assets are traded in a lot of places at the same time, right? Just to name a few examples, uh, you know, that's, that's just on the market structure side. When you look at the, the structure of data, it also creates major challenges. I mean, uh, there, there are no traditional assets that can trade at 18 decimals, right? Uh, you know, that can be very challenging for a system that wasn't designed for that. Uh, you know, the volatility of crypto markets can often for a system that's used for less volatility or wasn't designed to be able to sift through the volatility, uh, you know, can simply uh, look like a lot of attempt, a lot of manipulation uh, versus, you know, pure volatility, you know, just the volatility of a young market. Um, add to that the fact that regulation here is constantly evolving, right? Like literally from month to month, people have to, you know, our clients have to sometimes uh, adapt to changing regulation. Uh, many of them operate in a very multi-jurisdictional reality, which means again, you have to up, you know, to constantly uh, evolve your system to match with different kinds of regulation. And, and you know, also just the different economics of the space, uh, you know, require systems that are designed for that economic. And I can give a few examples in a bit, but the bottom line is that we talked to, client, we talked to some of our prospects and, and they were having a challenging time uh, monitoring for these sort of risks uh, with, you know, either on their own or, or with legacy systems. And so we set out to build a system that is crypto native um, and uh, that really uh, uh, unifies the compliance workflow all in one dashboard <clears throat> to make it more efficient. A system that uses, you know, it's a big buzzword, so we don't use it too much, but machine learning or at least statistical analysis to augment rule-based algorithms uh, to be able to, as I mentioned earlier, really sift through the noise in order I have to, to imagine there's a lot of human based modeling that you guys are having to do as well though like just a lot of grunt work to try to identify things right at least at least on the onset I would I would think 
Well, look, our, 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 our work, the way we help our clients is that we, we point them in the right direction, um, right? Uh, we make sure that we, you know, our system helps them, makes sure that they're aware of instances uh, that they should be aware of, right? Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, and, and one of the ways we do that is that in addition to, uh, you know, a rule-based layer, you know, most of, the, most, most of the system designed for traditional assets are rule-based, meaning they're designed to detect very specific uh, kinds of behavior that is known as a form of manipulation. In addition to that, we, 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 add, uh, we have a layer of statistical analysis that is able to, uh, you know, just essentially, you know, simply explain, run a lot of comparisons at the same time to detect anomalies. It could be uh, an account uh, that behaves suddenly very differently from its uh, neighboring account. It can be uh, an account that behaves suddenly very differently from its own behavior. A lot of different factors that go in order to add an extra layer of precision in our ability to, to point our clients to things that, that uh, they should really be concerned about and look into in terms of uh, trading behavior and transactional behavior. And so, you know, you mentioned before that, you know, there's been a ton of research into manipulation and, you know, a lot of that is focused on order book spoofing and, you know, wash trading, you know, what, what are the types of manipulation that you're looking for, um, you know, that you're finding, has it become more sophisticated? Are you able to, you know, look at things like the same, you know, wallet addresses across, you know, multiple exchanges? Like, how are you, how are you, like, what are you looking for? Like, you know, I guess at the, at the, at the lowest, you know, most basic level, what are you helping your clients identify? Well, the, 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 that's a, I'm not sure how many millions, but that's a, a few million dollars question. Uh, so look, obviously, first of all, uh, you know, uh, the way we like to think about it is, uh, uh, we, we think about it as the, the known knowns, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And I'm sorry for quoting, uh, I believe it was, uh, Donald Rumsfeld who said that, but, uh, you know, when you look at the known knowns, you're essentially talking about forms of manipulation that take place in traditional market or that we're familiar with from traditional markets, like some of the uh, uh, manipulation typologies you mentioned, wash trading, spoofing, layering, pump and dump, etc., cetera, uh, that essentially take place in a similar way in digital asset markets. Uh, mind you, uh, you know, up until this point, they often could have taken place more easily because of the lack of regulation, but, but at the end of the day, they, they take place in a pretty similar way and and the question is just detecting it in a crypto ecosystem, which, which is different in, in various capacities in than, than uh, detecting them in traditional, uh, uh, in traditional asset trading. The known unknowns uh, is, is, is for us the uh, forms of manipulation that we know from traditional markets, but take place differently in crypto because of the different structure of the market. So, um, you know, I'll give you an example there. Uh, so, for example, one thing that we see a lot is, uh, you know, you'll see a hack, some, an account takeover. That happens, it's a cybersecurity issue. It's not necessarily uh, what we focus on, it's just the reality of uh, the age of the internet. It can happen through social engineering, same swapping, anything else. The moment someone you know, hacks into an account, usually the first thing they wanna do is withdraw the money. Most systems, most trading platforms have some sort of a, of a, of a buffer, right? They don't allow you to withdraw the money right away. Definitely not large sums of money. What we would often see in crypto uh, ecosystem, in crypto uh, markets, is that instead of withdrawing the money because it's, in, it's they can't do it because there's this uh, block, uh, a, then a, a malicious actor would actually open another account within the same exchange and start trading a Bitcoin for a shitcoin, for example, over and over and over, and be right. able to sift that way just through a trade, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And that, and, and that unless you're looking for uh, and, and are very familiar and attuned with crypto economics, then the system wouldn't necessarily be focused on that. So that's, for example, an example uh, of, you know, just something that can happen in crypto that no one really thought about from traditional markets because it wasn't, you know, quite an option. Right. right? You're not trading shitcoin pairs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, and that's something that we see a lot. It's, uh, you know, and it, it, can be, it can be sometimes complex to detect. And that's where some of our behavioral detection models are very, very important because we're like, this doesn't really make sense. And you combine it with the non-economic element of the trade, uh, you know, as well as some of the other pieces. Another thing- Are, you, really are you able to get, uh, I mean, you're, you're partnering with the exchanges. So are you able to get account level information? Like, can you see that an account has just been created and has, you know, unusual activity? Feel like, can you associate multiple accounts to sub accounts? Like, do you have that level of integration with exchanges? So- you know, uh, unlike most, uh, unlike on-chain analytics firms, we work 
uh, primarily with private data. I mean, of course, we're also mindful of a lot of the public data. It goes into our uh, system as well, et cetera. But the core of the work is dependent on private data that we get from our clients. Right. That private data uh, does include accounts. However, uh, our, the way our system works in order to, uh, to, to, you know, to remove some of the concerns surrounding uh, cybersecurity, et cetera, <clears throat> uh, that you know, all of the data that we received is fully anonymized, encrypted, and obfuscated. And yep. also, uh, we, most cases, when we work with an individual exchange, uh, we don't require any PII for the detection. So in that sense, we would get the sort of data that you're describing, yes, but we wouldn't have the ability to uh, ourselves direct it, uh, you know, uh, connect it with a real person, right? On the client side, through a dashboard, uh, you know, our client side, right? Uh, they're able to, of course, connect it to the end user, to right. the account, specific trader, et cetera, depending on the particular platform. Right. We get it in a form where we, we can't connect it to anyone, but we're able to process it for uh, manipulation. Right, right. right, right. And so, you know, you know, kind of, you know, how widespread are these different practices in the market? I mean, you guys have been in the space for a few years. You know, I'm not asking for an exact number. I'm more asking for trends, right? You know, are, are some specific patterns of kind of illicit activity you know, happening less than they were before for a, a myriad of reasons? Are exchanges doing a better job at detecting those? You know, have people just become more sophisticated? I mean, you know, how, how widespread do you think, you know, manipulation or at least attempted manipulation is in this space? So to be honest with you, I think the question is not necessarily how, how widespread it is. It is how much can we know for sure, right? right? We talked about, we mentioned the reports uh, that, 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 you know, consistently uh, get released about the levels of manipulation. A lot of those reports are based on, you know, very, very meticulous work, but they still have, there, there are still a lot of assumptions made, right? Um, you know, uh, because again, it's not, it, you know, no one has access to all of the privileged private, uh, you know, account data, et cetera, in the market. Right. So, uh, you know, you're asking me how, I mean, so, so, I mean, based on all of these reports and, you know, based on our work, yes, it is likely that there are high levels of, uh, manipulation in this market. But to know for sure, we need to increasingly uh, improve the standards of surveillance or risk monitoring within the industry. Just as an example, uh, if, you, if, you, if you read the recent uh, uh, Crypto Compare exchange benchmarking report, uh, you know, they, they, they look at very, they, they, they essentially send a survey and also look at data in order to uh, rank exchanges based on the credibility of their volume. One of the things they focus on is compliance. And according to their survey, which includes around 160 exchanges, something between four and 10% of crypto exchanges today employ a specialized, externally provided, independently uh, developed uh, risk, uh, sorry, market surveillance system, right? Um, and look, and, and as long as uh, there's no market, the, the, the market surveillance, and, and, and as long as, the only way to know for sure really is to surveil the data. This is why it's 100% required in traditional markets, exactly right. to know for sure whether there's manipulation or not, to know for sure what's a clean market and what's not. So, you know, we, we can all speculate, and, and it's not only speculation. I mean, some, some very smart people have done very good research to reach the estimates of levels of manipulation, but the bottom line is that we'll only know for sure as the standards of risk monitoring and surveillance increase. And, uh, and you know, we, we, the way we see it, uh, surveillance is a way of uh, shedding daylight into this ecosystem and daylight is the best disinfectant. I think that's, by the way, Louis Brandeis who said that. Very, very cool. So, so my next question is not something that I've written down or talked to you about, and this is really not something that's necessarily illegal. But one thing that we always wonder about is, is quote unquote insider trading in crypto and crypto is not a security. So the idea of insider trading is a little bit bizarre. Um, but, you know, is that something that you guys have done any sort of research into? I mean, I think, you know, you know, part of what we have is, you know, a tremendous amount of data trying to understand and analyze what's actually driving the value of assets. And there are some times where, you know, we know that we are likely the first company that's seeing a piece of information. And before we see it, the market has already moved a bit. Um, and, and so is that something that you've seen across different exchanges? For example, like, X exchange lists Y asset and Y asset has already moved on, you know, Z exchange, you know, five minutes before X exchange announced that they were listing that asset. Like, is that something that you guys have taken a look at or something that your clients have been asking about? Or is it more just, hey, this is, you know, this is not a security. It's not really an issue yet. Um, so not something that we really are mindful of. 
I mean, first of all, of course, it's an issue because, you know, everyone's talking about uh, digital securities, right, and security tokens and, and, and right. you know, trying to integrate those spaces. And we work with a lot of clients who are building fully regulated ecosystems specifically for that. So obviously, uh, it's a concern. And look, and even if it's not a security, the fact that, you know, there's, some, there's always the question of uh, what's legal and what's moral, right? The fact that right. it isn't illegal just yet, again, right. it's completely illegal in traditional markets. Usually, if something is tr completely illegal in one market, there's good reason to assume it will become, it will ultimately be completely illegal in another market as well, because right. the regulator already established that it's a form of theft, right? Um, yeah. That can send you to jail. But, so, so, you know, like, even if it's not a security yet and it's not required, then people want to protect their clients. Uh, so, yes, it is something that we, we help a lot of our clients with. Uh, I think it's also something that is increasingly a concern as uh, prime brokerage, crypto prime brokerage become more and more of an issue. So you have more and more people who are uh, buying on behalf of other people and oftentimes, uh, you know, need to have some sort of a license for that or increasingly so in certain places. So yes, we do help with that. Um, and I mean, yeah, we, we, we do that. I mean, the, the other piece of what you said, right, is, is also the question of looking at a few markets at the same time, right? Um, and that is something that we, we are increasingly very, very involved with, uh, the question of cross-market surveillance, uh, which is, again, required for this particular ecosystem because the assets can be uh, traded in multiple places very easily at the same time. So, uh, you know, as a regulator or maybe even as, just as an investor, you want to know uh, that, let's say, the, the exchange, at least in the exchanges that you're trading in, you know, there's some sort of a protection. Uh, so, yes, uh, definitely front running is, is, a, is a challenge. It's something that a lot of our clients are thinking about. Uh, you know, we're also, interestingly, everyone's talking about DeFi uh, all the time. I just did a panel about it this week. Uh, when you look at DeFi and front running, it's a completely, it can be a completely different story. Uh, we're working with more and more DeFi exchanges who are thinking, how are they going to address the question of regulation and risk monitoring without uh, stymieing the merits of decentralization? And, uh, you know, on, in, a, in a decentralized market, you could theoretically or in practice, uh, you know, uh, front run on the block level if you're sophisticated enough. Pump enough gas to the, uh, you know, to the pool at the right time. <clears throat> program it in a way where, you know, your orders will always come right before someone else's. So it's definitely, uh, you know, that's an example for a traditional form manipulation that is definitely a challenge here. And uh, as securities and digital securities become more prominent, and I personally believe that they will, uh, I will become uh, more of a challenge and more of a concern for regulators. And so you just mentioned, you know, this idea of shared surveillance. And, you know, you mentioned to me that it's, you know, in your words, fundamental. Right, it's it's you know it's a, a a fundamental infrastructure necessity for for regulated crypto growth. So I'm gonna let you run with that. But you know, I, you know, you know, kind of the idea of ETFs as you mentioned before, and and but but really kind of running into why shared surveillance is so important. Yeah. So so first of all, uh, very timely. Just today, uh, we announced uh, our solution, our shared surveillance solution. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a it's a version of our product that is tailored for. Uh, for, you know, for let's say uh, entities that want to monitor for risk across multiple markets at the same time. Uh, you know, it could be a regulator that already has some sort of a licensing uh, regime in place uh, and can require, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, their regulated exchanges to share data to be surveilled. And it could also be a consortium of exchanges, uh, you know, uh, that, that want to create like a clean space together, either for, for a regulatory reason uh, or not. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 as I mentioned, like, you know, shared surveillance is a concept that came up a lot during, uh, that comes up a lot in the ETF rejection documents. Uh, and it is really one of the reasons that we wanted to jump into the space because we were like, there's a challenge here that requires a specialized solution. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, 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 you know, part of the reason, part of the reason we are offering this solution, part of the reason we are working with partners to establish a consortium here in the U.S. is to try and enable uh, an ETF by demonstrating that there's a clean market here that's, that's, that's across a few different markets. However, uh, you know, I don't want to limit the importance of shared surveillance just to ETFs. An ETF is a buzzword. People connect to it. It's very tangible. So, you know, uh, we mention it first, but uh, this challenge, the fact that the asset, that, that Bitcoin is traded in multiple places in a lot of, in, in, in multiple places at the same time, you know, the fact that it, it's global and, and, you know, probably will never be able to be fully regulated everywhere uh, means that uh, the, the ability to surveil 
you know, groups of markets versus just one market at a time is a, and essentially have a shared surveillance framework for crypto markets, as you said, is a fundamental infrastructural necessity for this space, uh, specifically for those who believe that uh, regulated growth is the, the path to growth for the space. If we want to grow in a regulated way, we as an industry are going to need to be able to demonstrate to regulators uh, that markets are clean across, not just uh, individually. And that, you know, there aren't actors that are manipulating at the same time in various markets and, and are evading detection in that way. And so you mentioned, you know, that you released this new shared surveillance product. And so what are the, what are the existing products that you offer? I mean, we know that you, you know, you work with exchanges and help them, but you also work with regulators, right? And so, so how, you know, or, or, and maybe there are others, like how do you work with different folks within the ecosystem and, and what are the kinds of solutions that you provide to them? Right. So, so you know, exchanges uh, are the core of our, uh, of our clients at the moment, uh, although we do work also with uh, brokerage firms and increasingly uh, find other use cases, so lending platforms. Could you work with like an OTC desk or would that not be as necessarily, like if, if they have an API or? Yeah, yeah, it depends. It depends, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely possible and we do that. Uh, and, and you know, and that's kind of one of the cool things, but also very challenging things about this space that, you know, it's not that everyone is trying to build the same, uh, exchange, right? Everyone's trying to build the best exchange and have a slightly different way to do it. So you find a lot of different, uh, use cases sometimes, uh, even when, uh, uh even when exchanges, even, even, even when it's, ex you know, just a, a few exchanges, right? Um, but, uh, exchanges are really, uh, the core of our clients today, as well as other crypto service providers. Uh, and, <clears throat> Uh, and as I mentioned, the way we work, the, the, way we, the way we support them is by providing our, uh, you know, market dependence and risk monitoring dashboard. What it means is that we, we, we provide a unified risk monitoring system. That's actually very, very important. Traditionally in compliance, there's a lot of uh, uh, siloing between different compliance systems, right? Crypto, in addition, just to, you know, in addition to, its, to the many, many elements of finance that it's transforming, it's also providing opportunities to transform compliance. Right? And the ability for, of, for a compliance team to manage <clears throat> everything in one dashboard, you know, whether it's uh, their KYC AML alerts, whether it's their onboarding process, uh, you know, their, their identity verifications, et cetera, all the things that are required to do, doing it all from one platform is critical, not just from an operational perspective, you know, just you know, simply it's easier to work on one dashboard versus a few of them, but also from a risk, from a detection uh, precision perspective, meaning that you know, I mentioned to you earlier the, uh, the example of a uh, of a hack followed by a non-economical trade, in order to be able to very effectively detect that, you need to follow the, uh, you know, you need to follow the transaction and the trade, right? Uh, so connecting these pieces in one place is, is a very important piece of our product. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the unified risk management system is, a, is a basically the hub that we provide our, client, uh, our clients to manage this. Behind it are very, very powerful uh, uh, detection Algorithms. That's our market surveillance piece. Uh, we also do support. Uh, we also do uh, transaction monitoring in certain cases. Elements of AML. Uh, and you know, one of the things that was really, really important to us, knowing that we're going to work with companies that are many of them. You know, even even the oldest crypto exchanges are still in some ways startups, right? Uh, our solution is very modular, meaning that you could potentially buy. Uh, you know, you could buy the the risk monitoring dashboard with just one model to begin with, to demonstrate to a regulator as you're applying for a license, uh, and then uh, you know, extend it as your need grows with volume and with additional challenges, et cetera. So uh, you know, unified risk monitoring, uh, that's uh, one piece. Our market surveillance, transaction monitoring, and AML detection models, that's the other piece. And uh, we do have another solution that's uh, uh, becoming very popular, and that's an onboarding solution. It's essentially a, a logistical framework where you can onboard clients all through one dashboard, uh, it actually fits very well into our product because what it allows you is to create a universal uh, a client overview where you, you can very easily go back and forth from the trading events to the transactional events and to the onboarding profile of the client to see if there are any, you know, to, to correlate and see if there are reasons to worry. And all of that is fed into a, you know, a single uh, a, or you know, a few uh, a risk monitor, uh, sorry, uh, a, a risk likelihood scores that they can manage on our dashboard. And so, I mean, I, I, I kind of have a, a theory on, on the next answer, but do you think crypto compliance is more reactive or proactive by exchanges? My, my answer would be it's, it's probably more reactive um, at this point, but maybe as a reaction to that, people are becoming more proactive. I mean, 
when you see, for example, you know, what happened with BitMEX and all of a sudden they're trying to buy every single compliance solution, right, on the market. Um, and, you know, you know, we're kind of seeing, you know, all of these different regulatory crackdowns, not just by the, you know, the SEC and the CFTC, but also by the, you know, the uh, FCA in the UK, by other, you know, regulators and, and entities in different countries. I mean, do you think that, that companies are starting to be more proactive or is it still a little bit reactive in terms of, you know, integration of compliance solutions? To be honest with you, I think that it's both. I think that compliance, in a sense, has to be always has to be a little bit pro, uh, pro uh, reactive because you are responding to uh, you know requirements uh, dictated by a regulator. But right. uh, there are definitely a lot. You know, most of our clients, I would say, are uh, you know very proactive about compliance, and you you can you can see a lot of actors that, that decided, even though we don't necessarily have to do to you know. To have that system in place, or have that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, or have uh, you know that compliance program in place, we will have it because we believe that it's the right thing. You know, I personally believe that it's the right approach, and that in the long run, uh, these are the companies that are going to uh, prevail. And I think today, more and more people, you know, we our tagline is that in crypto, compliance enables growth. I really do think that at this point in time, especially after some of the recent news that you mentioned, from the BitMix charges to the new pieces of regulation introduced everywhere, basically. Um, uh, you know, being compliant is a competitive advantage and, and the earlier you plan for it, the more you built your, your exchange, uh, you know, to be compliant, oftentimes, uh, the bigger your advantage will be. Uh, so, uh, it's a bit, a little bit of both. It's, 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 it has to be reactive, but I, we, we, we work with a lot of clients that are very, very proactive. And generally our recommendation is be proactive because, and you know, when you, 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 you can look at some of the recent enforcement action and it's very clear from how regulators are responding you know, to, to think that they see as problematic, oftentimes if they, if, if they believe that you did your best, uh, and again, I, I, I'm not providing any legal advice or anything like that. Like you well, just we had, we had a, we had a great, but, we had a great podcast episode. Um, I guess a few weeks ago with George Pesach from Kroll and Mooring. And he's like, look, just at least try to do the right thing. If you are a token issuer, you're an exchange. Don't like be like, you know, you know, go say that you can bribe, uh, you know, an official with a coconut, right? You know, you know, be, be, you know, his, his, his whole thing was, you know, look, at least try to do the right thing, right? Because a regulator is going to look and they're going to see, there's a huge difference between somebody who's trying to do the right thing and trying to be proactive versus somebody who's clearly just laughing in the face of regulators. Because if you do that, you're going to piss them off. A hundred percent. I mean, th that's exactly where I was going. Uh, the bottom line is that so much of it is about intent, right? You know, manipulation happens in markets. Market manipulation happens, abuse happens. Oftentimes, from the position of the intermediary or the, uh, you know, the platform, uh, what can be the difference is whether they did everything they could in order to prevent it and detect it and report on it. Um, and obviously, if you're doing everything you can to show otherwise, like, like some of the examples you just gave, uh, it's not going to look good to regulators. So, yes, 100%. And so... Just kind of going back a little bit, but just a quick question. In terms of manipulation, do you see it more with smaller coins or larger coins? Like I have to imagine manipulating the Bitcoin market is a hell of a lot more difficult than, than manipulating a small cap token with $500,000 in questionable daily trading volume. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it actually, it can very much depend on the, kind of manip on the kind of manipulation typology. But obviously, for example, pump and dump, Right is is very is is oftentimes used with smaller you know with smaller coins where you you know you can kind of relatively easily uh, with a bit of uh, shilling increase their value and then sell quickly. I still remember all the 2017 pump groups on Telegram and all yeah. that crap. And it, there, there was always the person who does well is the person whose group it is because they've already pumped before they told everybody else to pump. So no, no exactly 100. percent So right, so that for example is is very suitable for a you know, a small, uh, a small, uh, you know, you know, a, uh, you know, a low value altcoin, for example, right. although by the way, you could see it in big coins as well. It's just a little more rare, it, you know, in, in high value uh, assets as well. It's just a little more rare. Um, you know, I mentioned to you, obviously, if your goal is to, uh, you know, hack into someone's account and trade it for altcoins, then you would go with a high value coin. And, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, places in between, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is that we're still learning a lot about this market. We are constantly, uh, you know, uh, learning about new, and that's by the way the last uh, segment of the, of the, of the, uh, 
you know, of the, uh, of the Donald Rumsfeld quote that I brought up earlier, right? The unknown unknowns are new forms of manipulation that we're constantly discovering. Um, and uh, so, so we see, we see a lot, we, we see, we see a lot of both. Yeah, I mean, something that's always been interesting to me, and, and we've, we've seen this take shape, you know, in the past, and I don't know how much it is now, but just messing with reference price, with prices on illiquid exchanges to, you know, change the price, prices of futures uh, and options on different exchanges, right? If, if, if a market like, you know, BitMEX takes into account, and, and this happened before, right, where Bitstamp was one of three exchanges that they were using as reference pricing equally weighted for, you know, for, for, for Bitcoin options. Right. If you can, if you can, you know, change the price on Bitstamp, which is, you know, not relative. I mean, relative to the other exchanges, was was relatively a liquid. Right. You can then mess with the derivatives market. I mean, is that something that you're, that you guys are cognizant of, or I mean, obviously cognizant, but but aware of, or something that you're monitoring, or do you think that's becoming less of an issue? Again, it could, I mean, that's kind of the concern around an ETF, right? Is that you're messing with the reference price? Right. 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 I mean, look. So obviously, yes, it is something we're we're. We're focused on, uh, you know, again, our, our, our core business is working with individual exchanges, right? Uh, right. And they, they have very specific concerns. Uh, the, some of the bigger questions come, to, come, come when you start looking at markets as a whole, right? Which is what you guys do, right? You, right. you, you look at a lot of markets and, and, you know, what are the different events that are driving prices, uh, you know, from an external perspective. What we do with our cross-market uh, surveillance algorithms is that we, we're able to do it with the privileged data without actually, you know, uh, without exposing, you know, different exchanges to other exchange data. Uh, that's what the solution is designed for. But we, you know, we're able to do that on really with like di directly with the privileged data. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, of course you see that. So for example, you would see, uh, you know, long circles, we call it a multi-asset uh, wash trading, right? So you'll see a few different accounts on a few different uh, venues that would, uh, you know, say buy an asset A, trade it for asset B on another exchange, trade it for asset C, trade it for asset uh, uh, a, a D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can sometimes be dozens, right? And, you know, it would either be sometimes to increase the, the volume of trading or sometimes to try and increase the price. But yes, this is something that we're mindful for, uh, we're mindful of, and we help, uh, you know, our clients with both an individual level, but also on a market level. So for example, in some of our work with uh, regulators. And so you, you guys have been at this for, for about three years already. So how have you seen the regulatory landscape change since you first entered? And how have you seen government's understandings of cryptocurrency evolves over the years? I mean, I know I see that little DACOM, you know, uh, thing you got there, um, back there, you know, uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you pitch that as well. But, but Hen and his team or, organized, you know, Digital Asset and Compliance and Market Integrity Summit, which is for Compliance and Market Integrity Summit, really fun. Um, you know, I, I had a, I had a great time going to the one that you guys did in person. But yeah, so, by the way, so, I'm kind of I'm kind of disappointed that you don't have your program hanging in, in behind you. But sure, <laughs> it's behind it's behind so it's behind these jerseys. What I'll do is I'll move them later, and you'll see I have a giant poster. Okay, okay, great, great. Um, but no, I mean my point that's being though, where we that first met, right? I think so. We we connected before that, I think, but that's where maybe where we met in person last year. Um, but, but my point being is that you bring a lot of regulators to these events. You're interacting with regulators, you know, very, very often, and you're also interacting with law firms. And so how have you kind of seen, and maybe your clients seen regulators' understandings of digital assets change over the years um, and, and kind of the regulatory landscape surrounding digital assets more broadly? So, you know, I, I think uh, I'll answer your question, but I think that even before that, it's worth asking, how has the industry's approach toward regulation changed, right? About two and a half years ago, I think it was uh, April 2018, Jesse Powell Kraken said publicly, you know, it wasn't a slip. Uh, he's, a, he's a smart guy. He said publicly, crypto traders don't care about market manipulation and they don't want protection from it, right? I don't think that's something that anyone in the crypto space would say today. Uh, you know, just a few months ago, I heard uh, Josh Goodbody, who is the uh, uh, head of institutional growth in Europe and the Americas, I believe, for Binance, uh, in a conference, you know, standing on stage and saying market surveillance is extremely important, and that's Binance, which has not necessarily been historically associated with uh, strong regulation. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how, you know, we, we were like a bunch of, uh, you know, a journalist and a bunch of Goldman kids, and we started, and a bunch of Goldman guys, we started going to some of the most institutional crypto events back in 2017, 2018. We would mention the word market surveillance, and people would raise their eyebrows. People didn't really know what it was. That's not the case anymore. I think there's really a reckoning 
definitely after the, uh, the past few months of uh, enforcement action, the new pieces of regulation, that uh, you know, if this industry is to grow, it needs to find a path to be compliant and to address these concerns. What's interesting is that you know, there's still a gap, right? Like uh, it's, 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 you know, I mentioned to you some of the numbers coming from the Crypto Compare Benchmarking Report. We're still getting there. We believe that some of the challenge there, uh, that the challenge there is twofold. There's a need for more accessibility for crypto native tools that would make it cost efficient for crypto companies to uh, put in place uh, a, a, a market surveillance system. That's, that's what we try to do, to provide the best possible way for crypto uh, businesses to uh, monitor for these risks. Uh, but at the same time, there's also a need for crypto native rules. And that's when I go back to your actual question about regulators. Uh, you know, we just had a panel, a DACOM panel today uh, with, uh, among other people, Matt Homer, who's uh, the deputy superintendent for, uh, financial, for, for uh, innovation at the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, you know, and he talked about how the, you know, the, industry, you know, the industry has changed and therefore the approach that regulators are taking have changed, but they still don't feel 100% uh, you know, uh, uh, confident uh, in the system, right? They still need to feel more comfortable. Uh, I think that first of all, you, know, you're, you asked me how, how, how have I seen the, uh, you know, the approach of regulators change or, 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 or generally the way regulators see this market. First of all, they learned a lot. I mean, you know, I was at an event at the SEC uh, right before COVID started. And, you know, you see, uh, you know, senior SEC personnel talking about nodes and talking about smart contracts and talking about oracles. You know, there's really a feeling that they've, they're, 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 they've developed a lot of the expertise that they need to in order to be able to properly regulate this. Additionally, you're also seeing uh, kind of like a natural exchange between the industry and regulators. And the best example, of course, is Brian, Brian Brooks at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, right, who came from Coinbase um, and has already made some very, very helpful uh, or, you know, uh, you know, let's call it positive uh, developments in terms uh, toward, towards the ecosystem. Um, and finally, I think that uh, a big part of, of, of why regulation is becoming, uh, you know, more suitable and there's more clarity is because the industry was proactive in trying to develop standards on their own. So for example, on, on our own. So for example, uh, we are founding members of Global Digital Finance, which is a global organization uh, with, with hundreds of uh, members that, that <clears throat> developed a code of conduct for digital asset trading. We co-chaired the Market Integrity Code of Conduct and are now uh, very soon we'll launch a uh, shared surveillance uh, working group to develop that. Uh, a, you know, you, you actually are seeing a lot of effort from the industry to engage with regulators. You know, for us on a personal level, you know, on a solidus level, we knew from the get-go that at the end of the day, our solution is an, is an intermediary between the industry and regulators. It's a bridge. It helps bridge regulators and the industry. We built our solution with regulators. We demoed it regularly to regulators to get their feedback. Um, and yes, as you said, we have those relationships, uh, but developing those standards and developing the conversation uh, is, is critical. That's why we created DACOM as a forum that would, uh, you know, be a, a, a tailored forum for the professional development of crypto compliance personnel. And as part of that, also enable and encourage dialogue between uh, regulators in the space. When you were there last year, uh, we, we had the, the, uh, the honor of hosting Commissioner Hester Pierce, uh, who, by the way, insisted on doing a live Q&A with the audience uh, for an hour because the dialogue is very important for her. And the same is true for Commissioner Berkowitz of the CFTC, which my CEO hosted a fireside chat with a, as, as a keynote for this year's DACOM. Again, uh, you know, uh, regulators are very responsive. They want to learn. They want to improve. Uh, they, want to, they want to build this relationship with the industry and have a dialogue in order uh, to, to create the right sort of to, uh, rules for crypto. And uh, at the end of the day, with more and more crypto native tools to detect the kind of concerns more efficiently and more and more crypto native rules due to the combination of efforts by the industry and by regulators and the dialogue between them, we're moving towards, uh, uh, I believe, uh, regulated growth. Yeah, no, and I'm with you. And I, and I, I think it, it, it extends beyond, you know, market com compliance and integrity as well. I mean, you can even look at today, for example, the SEC put out a no action letter against a, a token issuer. Right. Um, which is only the third no action letter I think that they put out against a token issuer so far. So, I mean, yeah, it's certainly interesting to see just, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people complain about the, you know, what, what people believe is like a regulatory stranglehold on the industry, but I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think that regulators are, have been pretty open-minded, um, you know, to this industry. 
to its growth, right? You know, it's, you know, everybody in 2017, you know, was like, you know, you know, crypto is, you know, crap and it's trash and it's manipulated and it's this. And it seems like over the last three years, there's just been discussions and people have started to, to open their eyes and their mind more to this. Um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see, you know, you know, feel free to, to comment on this, but as we get a new SEC commissioner, you know, how that, how that changes this whole scenario as well. A hundred percent. And to be honest with you, I, I, I don't doubt that it's, you know, uh, the, 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 the approach of the candidate to this new asset class is going to play a factor in the decision to appoint them. Like, I'm sure it's something that at this point, whoever is making the appointment is considering. Um, yeah, but yes, 100%, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, I, I, I agree. I think that regulators have been increasingly, uh, you know, making, let's call it uh, signs of goodwill towards the industry. You can look at the SEC's, uh, 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 a, 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 they eased, uh, the uh, a, a accredited investors requirement not that long ago, which the, the crypto industry is very happy about. If you look at the uh, the banking exams that have been consolidated, you see a lot of uh, actions from regulators that are aimed at making life a little bit easier for crypto. But I think that, that you know it's not a one way street. Regulators are also expecting the industry to take steps to demonstrate that it wants to be uh, compliant, that it wants to improve integrity standards, it wants to mature. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, for example, is one of the reasons I believe that we're getting traction with our effort to create a, sh a shared data consortium, right? Because the industry wants to demonstrate to regulators that it's clean, or at least the elements of the industry that are clean want to demonstrate to regulators that, that, that they are and that they're doing their best. Yeah. And I think kind of just to add to that and then, you know, move on after, but, you know, I think, I think, you know, another example of that is just the institutional adoption, enterprise adoption that we're seeing, right? You know, institutions are very much concerned with regulatory compliance. Um, right, and, and making sure that they're participating in an ecosystem that, you know, for example, you mentioned with the ETF, one of the biggest concerns is custody. Well, institutions aren't going to enter this space unless they feel comfortable with their assets being custodied, right? And, you know, seeing platforms like Fidelity emerge and, and you know, seeing how much, you know, AUM Coinbase has with its custody solution and, you know, seeing guys like State Street testing, you know, custody partnerships. I mean, you know, those are real those are real firms that, that aren't just, you know, obviously Coinbase is crypto native, but with the other examples, you know, these are, these are, you know, old, you know, wall street been around, you know, have to comply firms. So to see them move into the industry, I think is a positive, you know, sign that they're also feeling more comfortable with regulators approach to the industry as well. A hundred percent. You know, you know, I don't have much to add because you said it, uh, but you know, uh, you know, just thinking about our current pipeline and knowing the kind of names in there, of you know very important traditional institutions that are trying to understand how they can expose their clients to this asset class without uh you know taking too too high of a compliance risk uh you know i i have to agree with you 100 uh, percent sorry go ahead no no finish up finish up no i mean just uh you're right right the industry has been talking about institutional adoption for a while both institutional adoption um mainstream adoption and regulatory approval or adoption, however you want to call it, all of that would require um, an increased ability to, to monitor for risks and to be compliant uh, at the end of the day. And I think that and, and that's, that's one of the key paths for the industry to grow. And that's why the industry is moving in that direction. And so, you know, moving on from, from compliance and, and, and market integrity into kind of the question that we ask all of our guests, right? We are the Fundamental Value Podcast is, is how do you define fundamentals for crypto? And you know, how do you think about you know, cryptocurrency valuation? Are you actively trading or investing yourself? Uh, more just you know, kind of on the sideline, you mentioned Neo earlier. You know, how do you kind of think, think about that you know, in your own kind of personal life? So your question is, what, what, how, do I think, how do I define the fundamentals for crypto? So first of all, infrastructure, better and improved uh, infrastructure that was designed specifically for crypto is critical for this industry to flourish. Uh, and, you know, you know, we're one example. But by, by fundamentals, sorry, I mean more like, like PE ratio is fundamental valuation metric for equity. How do you think about fundamental ways of actually valuing digital assets? Which is a very difficult question, and I, I haven't heard a right answer yet because there is no right answer. Um, so this is more of a subjective, you know. No, no, no. I, I understand. I mean, look, I have a lot of, uh, <laughs> I'm a high level guy, so I have a lot of high level answers for you, but I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm trying to think about it for a second. Um, 
Look, for, so, for example, how do you, do you think decentralized finance and DeFi and all the tokens built on top of Ethereum, should the success of those accrue value to Ethereum, right? Like th these are the kinds of questions that we like to ask, you know, our guests. I, I, I understand. Um, you can so, give us a cop out unsexy answer if you want, so. No, 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 that's okay, that's okay. I, I love the question, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I shouldn't be too quiet, right? It is a podcast after all, people are listening. But um, look, first of all, you know, before we even go into the fundamental value of the assets themselves, uh, you know, in a way I'm a skeptic when it comes to crypto. Not because, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in crypto, but I don't necessarily believe we'll all be paying each other Bitcoin in 10 years from now. And to be honest with you, I don't think it really matters at the moment because uh, you know, I think one of the biggest fundamental values of the industry, before you even go into the coins themselves, uh, into the assets themselves, is the fact that it's forcing traditional finance to uh, reconsider everything, right? Um, you know, to me, whether we'll all be paying each other digital assets or not, that's, that's already a fundamental value of the industry. Um, in terms of the fundamental values, value of assets, I mean, look, I'm not a big trader. I never was. We, you know, we're an infrastructure company, so we don't uh, necessarily, uh, you know, uh, follow the, 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 the ebbs and flows of, uh, you know, we're not necessarily, uh, we're not necessarily that, uh, at, you know, attuned to, to where is Bitcoin price right now. We are in the sense of like understanding if it was manipulated, but uh, you know, we're not, that's not how, that's not how, what our business is based on. Our business is based on being able to help our clients uh, detect manipulation, right? Um, but, you know, when, when people ask you, because you know how it is, right? If you do anything in crypto, then people think you're the expert on whether they should buy Bitcoin or not, right? It's so the funniest thing for me is all the times I get texts about random shit, like the most random coins, like, like, and, and no, not hit, hating on them, but like Einsteinium, I don't know what the hell Einsteinium is. I got a text the other day, should I invest in Einsteinium? I'm like, how did you even find that? Like, where do you even come up with these things? So yeah, I, I get that. I, my, my whole thing is I don't give investment advice, but if you look at my portfolio, there's a big piece of that in Bitcoin and nothing else. <laughs> right. I mean, look, first of all, I wonder if people just Google what is the least known digital asset you can tell me about. And that's how they come up with an Einsteinium or anything like that. I mean, yes, I, uh, uh, again, I don't give investment advice as well. Uh, in terms of what I do invest, it's uh, the majority of it is Bitcoin. I you know it's very kind of hard for me if you're talking about fundamental value. It's very hard for me to see how it will not continue to in in increase in value. So why? Structure? I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's what everyone else says. I just think it's very, I just think it's, 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 it's very clear, right? It's, it's scarcity. The fact that it's proving to be uh, valuable over time and, you know, in, in the long run, uh, it's hard for me to see how it doesn't at least preserve its value, if not increase. Uh, you know, and, and again, I, I'm not I'm not a big trader, but for me, these are fundamental uh, basics. Uh, you know, and, and if and if there was more doubt around it a few years ago, uh, I think that at this point, it's clear that it's here to stay. The question is just how much. But uh, uh, but the fundamental value is there. Um, you know, Ethereum decentralized uh, and, 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 you know, it's role in decentralized markets. I mean, I actually am a big believer in the, in the, in, in, in the, the merits of decentralization and the fact that they, are, they already are playing a big role in driving transformation and they will play a big role in actually, you know, providing services. Um, uh, again, I mean, at the end of the day, these are, you know, these are uh, ecosystems that provide things that didn't exactly ex exist before, uh, they're different. And, and so me, does that mean the ec uh, ecosystem should be valuable? The, the ecosystem itself? Does that mean that Ethereum should be valuable? Well, first of all, I'm a, I'm a former writer, so I put, a lot of, uh, I put a lot of value on originality or just being different. So in that sense, yes. But uh, I mean, yes, at the end of the day, yes, it's a question of demand and supply. The more those systems are gonna be useful, uh, the more valuable uh, Ethereum or other coins, depending on what you're talking about, are going to be as well. Um, and I guess that's my, that, was, that, was, that, was that a sexy or a non-sexy answer? Yeah, it was mostly non-sexy. I'll give you a little credit. The, yes, the rest of your answers have been sexy. So I'll, 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 give you, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the pass. I love when people come out of the gate, really strong opinion. But uh, no, I'm, I'm giving you shit. It was, it was a good answer. I think, I, look, at the end of the day, my answer is what is, on what crypto's fundamentals are is it's, it's sentiment. It's what people think about assets. 
it's community, right, which is related to sentiment, and it's supply and demand. At the end of the day, that's, it's a market that's void of fundamentals, right? I mean, there are no earnings, there's no revenue, there's no dividends. You know, sure, with some of these DeFi platforms, we're seeing some different valuation mechanisms, you know, start to, start to you know, kind of come to fruition, but none of them are widely accepted. And I, my perspective is you can't have fundamentals unless other people accept them, right? And, and you know, that's, that's what I often tell people when they, you know, when they ask me, you know, why, why, why does this even have value? I mean, my, my question to them, back to them is, why does the dollar have value? Because a lot of people decide that, that it does. Um, and, you know, and I guess in that sense, you want to talk about fundamentals. I mean, one of the coolest thing about Bitcoin, right, is that it could potentially be, you know, like a dollar. It could be something that, you know, you don't need to, to you know, you don't need to explain to someone why it has value because it has value according to so many people, right? I mean, you give someone a dollar, they don't need a, you know, a government to tell them that it's, uh, it's valuable. They see the color, they see what it says, they know that it's worth something. I think Bitcoin is headed that way as well. That like, um, you know. It's worth something because people think it's worth something. Yeah, that's true. By the way, that's true about everything, not even just about. Yeah, anything. Diamonds. Why are diamonds, why are yeah. diamonds so valuable, right? Why is a diamond more valuable than, you know, water? You need water to survive. You don't need a I diamond mean, I mean, the, 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 the easy answer there is because it's significantly more scarce. I think the interesting question. But to there ask are so be, many shitty cryptocurrencies that are scarce, right? You know, you can create any sort of artificial scarcity that you right, want to create. Right. So, I could launch so an ERC-20 token today that has a supply of 20. Does that right. mean it should have we're, worth? We're, we're, we're getting to somewhere, right? Because we're saying, first of all, it needs to be scarce to some degree, and it needs to be uh, you know, used by a lot of people. There needs to be demand. Right. So we could say- There we go, are, now you've got a much sexier that's, answer. Now that's the intersection of fundamental value. Uh, I'm sure we can think of a lot of other elements there. Uh, you know, some of it is, fa is, pas is uh, fashion as well. I mean, you know, sometimes it's luck. It could be that uh, you know, Bitcoin just got there at the right place, right? Uh, and may maybe there are other, a lot of other altcoins that are significantly more scarce and simply had terrible marketing. Uh, a, and no you know, community. Especially because at the end of the day, you know, in a way, Bitcoin can be considered old fashioned compared to some of the new, uh, you know, protocols and, uh, and, uh, and assets that you see today. Uh, so yeah, it's a, you're right, it's a question of community. It's a question of, by the way, we started by talking about narratives. It's a question of narrative. I don't doubt that a lot of the reason Bitcoin is doing so well today is because of the story behind it, right? An anonymous person slash group of people who came up with a brilliant idea and then disappeared. Um, who doesn't want to hear more about that, right? And so what worries you most about crypto uh, and what has you most excited? What worries me most? So first of all, to be honest with you, uh, I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> you know, like uh, I, don't, I can't say I'm worried. I'm, I have too many, I, I mean, I feel like I'm worried about that many things. Look, I am worried. Um, you know, that uh, the progress of, uh, of advance towards, uh, the, the progress towards increased market integrity is not going to happen fast enough or not going to happen. Look, there are a lot of people, and I get it, who, you know, hate hearing the word surveillance in the context of crypto, right? The whole idea was that there's going to be no supervision, you know, these libertarian ideas. Um, and, uh, Look, it could, it could happen that we stay at 5%. I mean, I don't believe it will because, because we're seeing the movement, but it could happen that we stay at relatively low level of um, you know, exchanges that are actually monitoring for uh, a risk monitor, that are actually monitoring for, for, for risk at a, a, you know, in, in a serious way. But to be honest with you, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to sound worried about it, but I'm, 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 I really believe that it's going to change because regulators everywhere are on top of it. I mean, and it's going to become a necessity. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I guess in that sense, I'm worried that we'll fight among ourselves. You know, I was just in a panel this week. It was a panel of uh, DeFi skeptics versus, versus people who are pro-DeFi. And I didn't like being put in the place of a skeptic because I'm not a skeptic as much as I'm a pragmatist. I completely understand most of the merits of decentralization, but um, I also know that there are a lot of risks associated. And for me, the question is, how do we mitigate those? Uh, you know, when we think about our product, our product philosophy, the whole goal is to create a solution that um, limits the risk to some degree without meaningfully or significantly stymieing the, uh, the, the, the merits. And, you know, and, and that's true for crypto as a whole. I think that one risk that we should be mindful of is, you know, kind of, you know, seeing the people on the other side of the crypto ecosystem, 
as, as, as foes versus just as people who are sharing valuable ideas. Ultimately, usually uh, when you have people pulling, in, people pulling in both sides, that's when an industry or a group or anything is able to move uh, forward. Um, so I, yeah, you know what? That's actually something that, you know, you just made me realize it is something I'm concerned about sometimes. It bothers me uh, that there are people that think that because, you know, we're talking about surveillance, we're trying to limit the potential of, of crypto. It's actually the other way. Um, you know, you can think about digital assets as if you compare it to a car, right? It's a new, exciting, extremely fast well, autonomous, think... car, aut autonomous car, but right, you, you wouldn't want to use it unless you knew that the brakes in it were strong. So what I'm saying is you need people building the fast cars and you need people building the brakes because only that way you'll actually be able to go fast. No, I'm, uh, I'm totally on the same page. I mean, like, it's the same thing with us. You know, I'm, I'm, I am a firm believer in crypto. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be full time in this industry. But at the same time, you know, we always take a skeptical lens to everything because you have to, right? You know, we're not going to move forward unless we're skeptics. If we're all like John McAvee saying, if Bitcoin doesn't go to a million, I'll eat my dick. Well, how are we ever going to move forward, right? And by the way, John, we're still waiting. So, uh, <laughs> and so, and so, so what has you most excited about crypto? To be honest with you, the fact that I know that even if in two years from now, no one is going to know what Bitcoin was, this industry is already changing the, the shape of finance. I mean, and by the way, I don't think there's any chance that it's going to happen, <laughs> but uh, you know, the fact knowing that it's not even about the end game, it's about the, the journey. And you know, these kind of conversations we're having right now, right, is all a part of rethinking the way things used to be done. So that gets me really, really excited. More than that, I get really excited about, uh, you know, looking, you know, I know we just talked about what the industry looked like in terms of market integrity, the approach to regulation two years ago. I'm super excited to see what it looks like two years from now, right? <clears throat> you have uh, 32 crypto and blockchain related deals, uh, uh, bills in Congress right now. You have MICA in the European Parliament. At the same time, you have exchanges that are finding a good balance between uh, you know, a very, very, you know, very effective, very accessible market and, and uh, enabling regulation. I believe that with a combination of some of the things that I mentioned earlier, more crypto native tools, more uh, crypto native rules, increased credibility for the market, increased adoption. Uh, this is going to be, it's hard to imagine, but an even more exciting space to be in in two years from now. And so my last question is, if you hadn't gone to crypto, uh, what would you be doing today? Uh, wow, good question. Um, I mean, I look, I, I, I love writing and I love education. I'm pretty sure I would have done one of those two. And I hope that one day I'll be able to combine that with crypto as well. Uh, you know, I'll be, I believe I would probably still be writing uh, and, uh, and teaching. Great. That and was not a sexy answer. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and so where can everybody find you online? Where can they follow you? We'll have all the links in the description, but just for anybody listening. So first of all, uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, please add me. Uh, I'm also at uh, Chen, C-H-E-N, at solidoslabs.com. I like how you pronounce your own name wrong so people know how to spell it. It's just easier. Can you, can you look, seriously, like, come on, you, you, you know your chets. Can you imagine how much time of my day I would spend explaining my name if I insisted on saying Chen every single time? By the way, one place where, where it gets really funny is Ubers sometimes. Because, you know, I step in and sometimes the driver doesn't believe me that I'm Chen because he's expecting something completely different. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I'm also on Twitter at Arad, uh, my, my surname, A-R-A-D-C-H-E-N. And honestly, uh, I don't think anyone should have a problem finding me if they would like to. And I would love to have a conversation with anyone who found what I had to say interesting. All right, Ren. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure, Josh. Thank you so much.